right, welcome back, Internet, to another episode of Makers on Tap, the podcast for makerspace people. <laughs> Some of us are directors, drink and talk about making stuff. Um, you can tell it's been a little bit since Joe's hosted. <laughs> it has been, boy. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm your host tonight, Joe, and with me are... Aaron. Chris. Matt. And Luke. All right. That is always so fun and awkward to watch people like, <laughs> is it my turn yet? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's also funny uh, when we're playing the intro music, since we can all hear it now on our new platform, it's fun to watch everybody's different dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like thinking, I was like, do I, uh, do I? Where am I? Oh yeah, no, I get into it. I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm yeah, all yeah, night yeah. at the Roxbury in it in here. <laughs> Great movie. All man. right. So Luke, Matt, who are you guys? Why are you here? What are you doing? Yeah, I'm, what are you I'm, drinking? Yeah, yeah, what are you drinking? We'll, we'll start yeah, with we, that. Um, we haven't is, done a what are you drinking in a while. So I'm drinking uh, Summer Teeth by uh, Columbus Brewing Company or CBC mm-hmm. here. Oh, so nice. Um, I haven't. I think I've had summer teeth before. The Bodie IPA is what everybody drinks, but I was just wanting something lighter, so it's pretty good. So, got to represent. Yeah, Hell yeah, for sure. Luke, what are you drinking? Um, if you have a chance to get the Bodie, you should get the Bodie. That's a delicious beer. Bodie, get the good. Bodie. All right. Uh, I actually have a homebrew that I brewed with Ooh. one of my buddies. It's called Plenty the oh. Warrior. It's a triple IPA. We call it a tripa. You know, you tri- okay. You drink it. Ten um, percent, and uh, it's got a lot of hops in it. We actually use a uh, concentrated hop extract to make it, so it's pretty interesting. To say. I dig it. I dig it. I'm into it. Is yeah, it like a Pliny the Elder? Like. Wow, that super dark, hazy, <laughs> uh, very heavy, thick. But it's got a creaminess to it because it's hazy and not clear. So it's not really like Plenty of the Elder or Plenty of the Younger, but it's a knockoff of uh, Plenty of the Younger with Warrior Hops. So hence Plenty of the Warrior. Nice. Very One of cool. the guys in our makerspace that brews does a Plenty of the Elder clone often. Ooh, and nice. uh, he's given me a couple of growlers of it, and it's pretty great. So <laughs> I want one. <laughs> Uh, tonight I'm going with one of my old standbys, uh, Voodoo Ranger IPA. Heck yeah, heck yeah. And nice stuff to do after the podcast, so I didn't really want to hammer it down. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And I just got some Blue Moon, the mango wheat. There you go. Hey, and you guys are actually drinking alcohol, and I'm just over here with my Baja Blast. <laughs> you know, I heard they're going to cancel Baja Blast. I did, which is why I'm addicted to it again before it goes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Aaron, I see you, you still have the remnants of our CR30 build in the background. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it actually works. I don't know. No, no, I'm talking about all the beers we drink. Well, we <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there are several yeah. cans of dank meme, empty dank meme behind me. For the record, we built that together. We're all vaccinated now. So, like, we could do stuff. The CDC says we can. It's yep. fine. <laughs> well, think. and we were still, like, safe and whatnot. <laughs> like, we were, we were definitely not, like, coughing all over each other and whatnot. But... Yeah, we we got together for Aaron's birthday and got to got to actually build a 30 and hopefully in the future we might do a video around it around some of the stuff that we found with it during building that one while we build mine. Um, yeah, we started a fight on the internet and uh, <laughs> showed everybody wiring scariness and like that was the most Twitter active Twitter thing that I've ever started. That was fun. <laughs> I was surprised yeah. how much traction that got. I was too. I was surprised at how much argument there was over whether or not it's okay to put 10 wires in a screw terminal. If you're wondering, it's not. It's not it's, okay. Really? There's I didn't like know that. Loads oh, of yeah. engineering papers on why it's not and studies on why it's a fire hazard. And like, so you can argue with me all you want about how 10 wires are okay, but they're not. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, I could see it, little my little things like that. I could see starting a, a battle like that. That makes sense. We we argue about that stuff all the time. What well, you can yeah. and can't do with wires. It's like all the time. 
Luke's always right. Yeah. <laughs> I I have never seen a paper saying you should tend wires in a screw terminal. I've seen lots of white papers on why you shouldn't tend wires in screw terminals and like after you say that out loud, it makes a lot of sense. Because you're like that small point of contact where the tin touches the top of the screw terminal isn't really gonna cut it. Right. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense once you said it out loud, but I've never actually thought about it. Yeah. It's one of those things where like there is applications where it is acceptable and it's like, okay, maybe in this circumstance it's not as bad. We actually like me and Joe were talking that night of like audio work. That's a very common practice in audio work for you to tend your wires for you to go into some terminals. Um, but like you're also not carrying a whole bunch of load on those wires, so it's not as much of a risk. It's yeah. still not good practice, but it's not as much of a risk. Um, and that's well, and why also, it really those, a lot of those terminals are round. So they're kind yes. of they're like they're mm-hmm. made to accept a round wire versus screw terminals are usually square. And they're made to accept either a bare wire that will be crushed in the terminal or a square crimped furl. And like when you get that that round kind of like semi crystal and metal in there that softens over time and crushes, then you get the you get flutter in the contact and then you get arcing and then you get fires and it's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a recipe for disaster that's been known for quite a while that the inactiveness towards fixing it is really irritating to be honest. Yeah. But you know, all that's covered on Twitter. If you follow us, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even why they do it, uh, that was addressed by Naomi. So that, you know, that was a, it was a good, good thing. Anyway, we are here with Matt and Luke for reasons. Uh, <laughs> who are you guys? Why are you here? Yeah. So we're, uh, we're with IC3D. Um, you might be familiar with IC3D from filament, um, but we do a handful of other things. So filament's one, one part of what we do. Um, but we also, uh, have a 3d printing service and we also now manufacture 3d printers. Uh, we have a, a consulting wing, uh, where we have a, like a research grant with the army so that we have an SBAR with the army. Um, oh, to, wow. uh, manufacture that is not easy to, get. to develop a, a specific filament. Um, so we actually are, are, uh, very vertically integrated as a company. Just, we have kind of a lot of different things that we do and we're pretty spread out. So, but a lot of, a lot of people are familiar with us, uh, because of the filament that we make, um, it's, it's one, one thing that we do. So, and, uh, I am, you know, my, my title would be COO. So like you know, chief operating officer, it used to be when we were really small was, uh, VP of everything else. Uh, so it's just like everything else was kind of my thing. Um, but Luke is our, is our extrusion, extrusion engineer. So Luke, Luke makes filament. Um, Luke is now spending a lot more of his time developing, uh, new materials, working on the SBAR, uh, and and helping to build a lot of the equipment or modify a lot of the equipment to make upgrades to what we do. Um, which is something that I think you'll, you'll find a lot of shops, uh, you know, like us are, are constantly kind of building a lot of our own stuff. So. Do you guys still run the open filament standard where like your filament extrusion line is all open source and everything? It is. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah, it is still open. Um, we have not changed, uh, we've not changed that about the materials that we've, that we've, um, you know, released as open and got certified as open. Um, we, we probably aren't as on top of it as we should be as far as updating our documentation. Uh, and then the new materials we're releasing, you know, that aren't open, it's mainly just because of timing and just the effort getting the documentation ready. And we just haven't gotten there yet. Oh, so for sure. I think there'll be more, more of the materials that are open. Um, and we've been, we've been kind of a little slow on releasing materials in our printing service. We've been using a lot of new materials for the last 12, 24 months or so. But we've got a lot that we're just trying to roll out a new one every month or every other month here soon. So you guys saw the Recycle PG came out recently. Uh, we got a PC PBT coming out yeah. uh, this month. Um, we'll have a UV, UV PEG coming out the next month. We just got a few more. So I can keep going, but I don't remember what which month. Awesome. Is what, so. High temperature ABS is in there, right? 
We got a hard time right. videos coming out. We got an ASA right. we've been working on for a while. ASA, yeah. um, but the UV PET G, I think, is going to be more popular than the ASA. That's just me. So I would agree with you. <laughs> From printing ASA, I agree with you. Yeah. So we've been using that for like I, over a year, like maybe a year and a half, and we just we've been really. Uh, it sounds sounds kind of silly. We we really haven't just been uh, we've been focused on other things, and it, we just haven't released it as a product, which is silly. So, I, I guess maybe well, COVID kind of happened and really flipped. I, you know, I hate to say the same thing everybody says, but it really did kind of change our plans. So, that brings up a really interesting thought because it, we haven't really talked to we've talked to people who made things during COVID. But we haven't talked to anybody who made filament during COVID. How did that change your your core? Like that was fun. <laughs> so but, okay, was a lot before of COVID, what was like your best selling filament? Um, we've I feel like ABS has always been the best selling filament, which is really strange. Really, um, we because the very first one we made was ABS, um, mm-hmm. and. So we only made ABS at one point. That was that was the first thing we did, um, and then I think we really hooked in with a kind of like a core group of ABS users who just bought our ABS, and a lot of the guys I know that well, you buy made ABS really good ABS for like six years or something. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it, yeah. A lot of people really really like it, um, and a lot of it's three mil ABS, which is now getting even scarcer. Um, so that was yeah. that was our core and i would say because we do a lot of b2b um filament sales i i would almost say i could still say abs might still be the bulk of what we make luke would know way more than i do i don't know um actually it's changed recently which is interesting no, okay. um i i think it actually got surpassed by pla um in the most recent time and uh pet g is definitely very close to abs after that so abs is second right now um but i do agree pre-covid uh abs three millimeter black would be our number one best-selling filament of all time (laughs) interesting yeah i have some rolls of that (laughs) on our shelf over there um probably because of lulzbot um i think if you go on a unit basis if you go on a unit basis, I think you'll see the PLA sells more units, but I think volume wise, ABS is probably still on top. We move a lot of ABS. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when COVID hit, what did that do? Um, or I guess got, when the PPE craze hit. Specifically for filament, um, we were consuming, we started consuming a lot because we were printing face shields like everybody. Um, and then we got hit with a couple different oh, big, uh, big orders. Makers for COVID was huge. Um, I'm trying to remember who else we did. Was it Mid South Makers? Am I getting confused with someone else? Make, make Make for COVID was huge. They bought a lot. Uh, at one point, we were shipping out like three pallets a week, two or three pallets a week um, of material over to those guys. Um, and, wow. Uh, we switched. So, I mean, we, we're filament wise, we're maybe not as big of an operation as some of the, the bigger guys. We have two extrusion lines, um, but we were running 24 hours a day, which is really unusual for us. Uh, and I think we ran like 24 six, Luke. I don't, I don't remember. 24 five. Yeah. 24 five. Okay. So we were in 24 five, um, which was, which was pretty wild. And then we had the guys who were running at night. We're also flipping the printers or, you know, starting the printers over. As we got about 30, 30 Taz's, Taz workhorses um, that we're making. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, I think each machine was probably making 21, 24, 20, 21, 25, 26 uh, face shield, you know, brims a day. Um, and so we were, we were actually running out of internal filament because we were shipping so much of it out. So we were actually like playing around with just kind of using anything we could, which was really pretty weird it's pretty unusual for us um and then running 24 7 was interesting i mean um uh, yeah that was that was a new one for us I, that might be common for other companies to do but we don't normally do it yeah that's crazy we also brought on a lot of new staff during that time we had to train three new guys um, yeah to help us run 24 hours a day um 
we were doing a lot of more, a lot more respooling. So we're breaking down large, large, uh, 10 kilogram spools into five kilogram, mostly five kilogram spools or 2.5 kilogram spools, excuse me. Yeah. I remember being pretty worried about material shortages. So we were buying, I want to say maybe 10 to 15 times the amount of plastic we were like, I mean, you know, yeah, it probably maybe, yeah. maybe we had 10 times the amount of plastic kind of sitting in the back, ready to go, just kind of stacked up. And that was really pretty strange for us to, you know, so we were making more filament in a week than we would make in a month. Easily. Wow. wow. Mm. So was stockpiling the plastic, was that validated? Did you end we up even like... stockpiling it? It was going out the door, man. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> seriously, it was just flying off the shelves. Like we were putting pallets out of massive amounts of spools, like every few days. Um, I, yeah, it was busy. Yeah, I think I think for a short time it felt like we were stockpiling it, but it just yeah, it, it, it wasn't it very long before it was all gone. So it, it didn't even matter. So so definitely justified. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there was a pretty big shortage for clear PEG face shields, and that was mm-hmm. definitely like everybody ran out of that immediately. Yeah. Yeah. We're still feeling the price change from that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you, you have a lot of people who like found you during that kind of spurt up that are now staying with you because of the quality of your guys's filament now? Yeah. I mean, it definitely went up and you know, it didn't maintain that level, but it definitely went up and is higher than it was before, you know? The, the revenue for that is higher. We definitely sell more material than we did. Um, and we had a lot of guys, at least for make for COVID, you know, that were kind of saying like, oh, we got some of that stuff. It was great. We loved it. Especially the Pet G. People people really like the Pet G. Um, honestly, I haven't benchmarked that many other Pet Gs. So I think like ours works really well. <laughs> I like <laughs> it. But people really Fair like enough. it. So they really like it. Yeah, I would I would agree. Definitely people stuck with us after that. No, it's awesome. I think the other big thing that happened was a shift from smaller quantity units to larger quantity units. So our we've just done a lot more sales of high, um, you know, high high quantity units. Like we're doing a lot more ten kg spools, mega spools that we would have never done before. So we're just selling those a lot more regularly. The mega spools are interesting because it's always like, how am I going to hold this? And can my extruder spin this? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a trick. I think anybody who does large format printing at some point struggles with it. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's been too many really good solutions so far. Um, we actually just built a motorized spool holder. So um, we've been using it for a few weeks now. Um, yeah. Teasing out the problems with it. And it's it's been going really well. Um, so we is print- it tied back to the like the extrusion output so that like they they're kind of clocked together? It's it's like um, it's it works like the palette. It works like the mosaic okay. palette where um, it just once it gets there's enough tension it just triggers a little release of more material. So nice. it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, we think we're going to release them for sale. That's kind of the plan. That um, was really just something we've been developing in house for our own use. Um, so we think that's where, where it's headed. Um, more just a tool so that other people can use the 10 kg spools. Uh, but we print on Taz, we use 10 kg yeah. spools on Taz's. We use 10 kg spools on our big machines. Um, use them on everything. Um, sometimes the five, the five pounders or the, the two and a half are a whole lot easier to use. It just kind of depends on what, what material. Yeah, I've, I've got a five kilogram spool from the COVID stuff that I haven't opened yet. And now that I've got this CR30, I'm like, I don't, I don't even know if I have anything that can hold that spool, let alone pull it. So I think, you no, know, I, I bet you, you know, with these belt printers just coming out, I think there's going to be a, a, an increase in need for something like a motorized spool holder for, for these larger spools because these machines are designed to, you know, print 24 7. Yeah. No, I think you're right. And, you know, for us, I think we've been kind of blessed to just, we don't, sometimes we just don't think about filament. We can just, leave the spools on there and keep going. Um, right. when you're doing, when you're doing big, big prints, you know, even with the 10 kgs, we, we still have prints where we're swapping 10 kg spools mid print. Um, and that's, 
that's still pretty painful. Um, I wish we could go bigger. And I think the motorized bull holder might allow us to go bigger. Um, and not that I really want everyone having to like lug around like 40 pound spools, but it would be helpful. So but one I of mean, the problems that I ran into running mega spools was actually the spool freewheeling mm-hmm. and like yes. releasing more filament and loosening the bundle up. And then that causes knots. And it's like, that was terrible. So I ended up like making a spring loaded wiper pad from the Taz and just like running tension on the rim of the mega spool. And yeah, <laughs> that's a good way. Yeah. We've done that before too. Yep. Yeah, we, we went through a period where we put paintbrushes on all our spool holders, so the brush would be like Wheel of Fortune style. Like, <laughs> <laughs> click, click, uh, click, click, click. It, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, it, it, it's really hard to pull, so you're like, let's put bearings on it, and then you put bearings on it, and then it pulls way too and fast. It spends you're like, forever. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, we, we've been through every, you know, all those iterations over years and years, and um yeah, this is kind of, I think, the first time where I feel like it, it, it's going to be a lot more consistent. Um, yeah, I agree. It's kind of a pain in the butt. And I, I've talked to other guys that own big machines and kind of no one really seems to have a good solution. And they're like really relieved. Like, oh, it sucks for you too? You're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's always validating. So, so one of the things that... Um, my friend Adam and I have talked about a few times that we want really bad is a pallet that just has two outputs or two inputs that just purely is for spool swapping when running big prints. And like, we've talked about some solutions with like the tool changer using uh, sister tools and a fil- filament runout sensor. Cause you can like start a print with the tool changer with like tool zero and pause it, put tool zero away, call tool one and like start the print again and it'll work. Yeah. So w- you can script that and make that happen. But I'd also just really like like a $200 pallet that just works and only has two inputs to splice spools. <laughs> yeah. Make I mean, that. It's true that the pallet does that, you know, the pallet does exactly that. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to spend $700 for it because I don't do multicolor prints very often. Yeah. I just, I just want big prints. Big. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I so. think that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's, you know, we have, we have, we basically have one side of the pallet right now. So the splicing though, I don't know. That seems like a lot, but it would really help us to not have to uh, swap out spools. So yes, we've, we still, I guess we still run into that issue. So. Ah. So um, you mentioned the recycled PETG. Uh, you guys are doing a couple of things for Earth Day, I think is what Claudio told me. Yeah, for Earth Day, we're doing uh, the first, at least I've seen, spore return. It's an official spore return. Um, the, you know, I guess the, the main goal is kind of for us, I think, is to tease out how realistic it is and, you know, see where the problems are. There's a huge issue with spool return, right? It, it's not financially, it doesn't financially make any sense to ship spools. Um, and right. so, you know, we, we know that. And we have a couple customers that are big printing customers and they do ship them back. Um, and if, if we get a pallet of 200 to 300 spools back, it actually is cheaper to get those returned to us than it is to just buy new spools. It does make financial sense at some point. Okay. Um, and so... I think with this one, we are we have a Discord channel with all of our printer elves, and we're trying to get anyone interested to join that, and just kind of hoping that everyone can kind of work together as a team to find out some good ways of getting spools back to us. You know, people are local; it won't be a big deal, um, but you know, hopefully, there's some clusters of guys, especially if they're printing elves, um, or maybe it make make for COVID. You know, if, if there's some way that guys can work together to get that to us. That's kind of what we're hoping that that'll work out. So we're, we're trialing that we're trialing another thing that I don't think we've made really obvious, but it is in there that we are going to accept inland spools. So, uh, we are accepting the okay. micro center brand inland spools. Um, and I would like to be able to release our recycled PTG on recycled spools. So there will be a little bit of a trick there. I don't want people to think that we are buying, 
uh, material from inland or from China or anything like that. I want people to know they're recycled. Um, yeah. But, you know, those guys, those guys have a big store near us and they have, um, they sell quite a lot of material and there's going to be a lot of those spools floating around and potentially going to the trash can. Um, so I think that would be a really easy to recover spool that we could reuse again. Um, so, but yeah, again, I, I, I need, we need to find a way to make sure that everyone realizes that we are recycling those pools. Uh, but that was something that I yeah. wanted to try was we, we can't just, so at least for now in this controlled experiment, we don't want to say everyone bring us any spool that you have. Uh, that'd be really bad. Right. Um, but I don't know if necessarily if I want to say just IC 3D spools, because I think it's going to be pretty limiting. So, um, we're going to try that. Yeah. We're going to try that and we're going to see how it goes. So, so is it any size spool or like the two and a half kilogram and the mega spools fair game too? any size IC 3d spool in combination with the one kg inland spools. So that's where we're starting out with. Okay. And then on the 24th, uh, we're going to basically have an open house, uh, for anybody who wants to kind of come by, drop off spools and, you know, see the shop and take a tour. So, we used to do a lot more tours pre COVID. Um, we used to have a lot of gatherings pre COVID and, uh, which I think we're, we're kind of itchy to be able to get back into that. Um, but you know, I, I, we want to get more and more people to be able to come through and take a tour. So. Okay. You guys want to take a road trip to come Columbus on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be, we'll be here. It's, it, it's, it's, it's probably tempting. drink. <laughs> We'll be here. I think it's like, I think, I think you guys are like seven hours from us. It's, it's a bit of a trip. <laughs> I don't know anything going on. Depends, depends on, uh, dep- everyone's got their different, you know, uh, limit. For yeah. Driving, so that's, that's not bad. It, that's, it's not, that's not the, the edge of my limit's like 11 hours. That That's in the driver fly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's if fair. you were to come to IC3D, we have an open shop, and you can always come back and check out and see what we're doing, see the manufacturing lines, see the printers, see what goes on. So that's the great thing about coming to visit in person. Heck yeah. Nice. So um, with the your recycled PETG, uh, tell us more about that. How is that like... What's the difference between recycled and like the normal PETG, like print wise and everything? Give us the yeah, rundown. So, so print wise, um, it's a little bit more like PLA. The temperature resistance is lower. Uh, it's a little bit weaker. Um, it prints colder, um, but it doesn't seem to warp as much. Not that PETG warps as much. Um, it's just kind of like a little bit. Uh, less lesser PLA, I would say. Um, really good for making general, kind of just general anything. If you don't have any, you know, hard requirements, if you just want to kind of print, like we're going to probably do a lot of our toys for tots out of recycled PETG. Um, I have a chair sitting next to me that we made out of recycled PETG. I have a a lot of the stuff I did in my van, The a lot of the shelving things I did, I did out of RPG. So um, it's you know, something that, um, is really easy to use. Um, and for me, it's going to be a lot lower cost, you know, internally we, it's lower cost for us. Um, but we're also pricing it a lot lower than our normal material. So that's something I'm pretty excited about. I think as a U.S. manufacturer, difficult to make a lower cost material. Um, and you know, even we're still sitting at like 25 a kg, but if you get into the mega spools, you're at like 150 for a 10 kg, and then try, I would like to get the black a little bit cheaper. We haven't, we haven't changed the pricing on the black. Luke and I are still working on that. Um, some of, some of the recycled pet G, um, some of what we're doing with the recycled pet G actually kind of came from some of our customers. We have one big customer who, who said, I want the prototypes that you guys make for us, uh, to, I want to be able to ship them back to you and I want you to be able to grind them up and reuse them. Um, you know, in, in our world with thermoplastic, that's not crazy as long as things are kept fairly clean. Um, and this, this 
customer, mm-hmm. I would say we would probably do 50, 60 pounds a month of material or so. Um, so okay. it's not like a lot, but, you know, maybe compared to what, I, you know, kind of someone in their basement just playing, playing around, that might seem like a lot of material. Um, so, you know, over time, they might three, 400 pounds, uh, something like that, they'd ship back. And we actually bought a, a decent sized grinder. Uh, and so we actually grind that material into a regrind. Um, and we, we can mix that regrind back into this recycled PETG. Um, up to, I think Luke, Luke said he did up to 30%. I don't know if we tried to go higher or not. Um, we have not so we, tried to go higher, but I'm certain. Yeah, we, we haven't tried to go higher. So <laughs> it, depending, depending on how much recycled PETG we produce versus how much regrind we end up with, we, we have to figure out where that ratio is going to be. So I think my dream right. is that we'll be able to use black recycled regrind to actually color the new material black, which eliminates okay. some of our cost, which would make the black even cheaper. Uh, so I'm hoping that that black, we can make that black product cheaper. And even for, for locals, I want to do a discount for local pickup because we do we do price things with free shipping at some point. So I would like to be able to do, if you're local and you can come and pick it up, there'll be a further price reduction on the material. Um, and I think that's going to also push towards future spool returns also as well. So, you know, I don't know how we're going to do that yet. I mean, we, we want to avoid a, a annoying system where someone returns a spool and they get a coupon or, you know, we want to avoid a system where it, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it takes a lot of manpower and effort to, to run and do something simpler. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're, we're experimenting to figure that out. So I think, I think building so, this local um, system is going to be key there. Uh, that's really cool. So you said that when you're printing with it, it runs cooler and uh, has lower temperature resistance. Is that like, is that a factor of like polymer degradation from you know, being run through the extruder multiple times, or is that some sort of modifier you're adding to it or what's, what's with that? Yeah. I Luke, if you feel like you can answer this better than me, then definitely uh, answer it. Uh, but I, I would say that recycled PTG is not, um, it's not our normal PTG that we've already heat cycled a bunch. Um, it's a post-industrial waste that we purchase uh, as okay. post-industrial waste. So it's already considered, I don't want to say it's considered scrap, but it's, it's you know, it's not meeting whatever spec they want. Yeah. So it, it would it's go not to the meeting. dumpster otherwise. So we're just keeping it from going to the dumpster basically. Um, yeah. But the polymer specs on that material are much wider than the polymer spec that we would use for our normal PETG. Um, okay. So you're so you see a lot more variation in the material uh, and the quality of the material, um, and so that's why we're actually still kind of ironing out what the black pedgy will look like. Um, we have to play around with how much, what percentage of free grind can we use, and does that percentage of free grind need to change based on the raw material that comes in? Because there's a uh, you know there's variability in the raw material, there's variability in the regrind. Um, Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that the output material that we're shipping out is extremely stable, right? And has no variability. So how do you do that, right? So you kind of have to balance the inputs into the extruder to get a stable output product. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that recycle, that recycle PEGI, it just has a wider spec on it as far as mechanical properties go. And from what we've seen, all the material that we've received, it has, um, you know, less thermal stability. And we have to extrude it at lower temperatures. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It, the stuff that I've printed that very much holds true, but it prints really well. Um, it. That's interesting. I I went and toured a. Um, they is a company that makes drywall products, and they make everything or as much as they can out of recycled PVC. So they make like corner beads and all that stuff. And they have a whole process ahead of time 
to remove all of the pet G that potentially comes in. They like run it through with a UV light and the pet G glows versus the PVC. So it was really interesting seeing all of that. And now hearing this, like, huh. <laughs> so the pet G acts as a contaminant in their PVC product. So they want to remove yeah. that. They probably have sim- similar melt properties and it would uh, destroy their process. Um, we run into a similar uh, issue with recycling uh, PLA. Um, so PLA, scrap recyclers won't take PLA because it acts as a contaminant for things like HDPE. Um, okay. So they don't want it. Interesting. <laughs> they don't want to see it. They don't want it in their facility. And so it's really hard to recycle PLA in that way. Huh. That's fascinating. It really is. Um, I also saw recently a video on how the recycled plastic industry is a sham and like almost no plastic actually gets recycled and all of the symbols are just resin codes and not recycling codes. (laughs) Well, that's sad. And and that broke my heart. Yeah. We want to change that. And you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about and I don't want to see PLA going into the dump. I don't want to see us have to burn coal or, you know, whatever source of energy we have our electricity coming from to heat a giant incinerator to like turn PLA back to biodegradable resin. Like let's just make it back into filament, you know? Yeah. Well, so that's, that's a, something like, that we're able to do with this grinder. And uh, that's something that we're able to do and achieve with this recycled PEG product. That's, no, awesome. that's awesome. Now I'm going to buy more. <laughs> <laughs> well, down the road, not- we will do more recycled things. Um, yeah this is just the beginning we're trying to figure it out what does it look like how can we make it economical to the customer Um, one thing that matt didn't mention that he is very passionate about is he prints and he prints a lot of stuff for his his van and he is a consumer of you know consumables for 3d printing and he wants to see the that value passed on to ic3d customers so he's constantly working to figure out how can I make more value for IC 3D customers? And that is something that we believe we are really achieving with this recycled PEG material. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. It's it's interesting because I think we we do a lot applications wise for large businesses. Um, we solve a lot of problems. We do a lot of like, oh, what temperature can do this and what strength and how can we design this? But the material that people are like, oh, what's your favorite material? It's like, well, I've used like, hundreds of pounds of recycled pet G personally for myself, but I can't say that about any other material. It's my favorite one. Um, Mm. It's just the raw material cost is, is affordable. So affordable compared to what I can do with it. Like, Mm -hmm. and, and I know that at least I'm, I'm like kind of given a second life to something. And then I think on top of that, now the, the knowledge that like when, when we're done with it, I can just like, if, if we're, de- I mean, if I'm ever done with it, I guess, you know, we can just like grind it up and use it again. That's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, it's, it is pretty neat. And I'll say, uh, that, that, that's another kind of possibility going along with this kind of local spore return is ultimately like a future of like returning scrap or recycling scrap. You know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of problems with that. It's not like we can just do it. Um, but specifically like with this, this, for this kind of big customer that we're trialing with, um, uh, trialing this, you know, it, it, that is something legitimate. Like these parts that we're printing are, are being printed w- with the intention from the very beginning that they're actually going to get recycled. Like we know we're going to get them back in less than 12 months and they're going to get recycled. So, uh, they know that we know that. Um, and it's not like, uh, we're putting a stamp on it saying, well, you can recycle this if you want, if you can find a way, or if someone will take it, it's just purely like, these are actually, these are have right. a limited life. They're going out, they're coming back and we're done. It's not a perfect system, but it's a good trial. Um, and we, right now we're calling it the circular mm. polymer system because we want to, we want to actually advertise this and do more of it. We, you know, nice. how many other customers have that same intention I, and I'll give it, you know, I'll give a hats off to them. They're the, kind of the first customer that ever came to me and were like, Hey, you know, as long as, as long as the price is about the same, you know, like we, we want this, we want to, 
we want this to be recycled and you know we're placing um, a higher value on that than um, just what's the cheapest so if the price is the same or even if it's maybe a teeny bit more you know we'll do this because we know it's getting recycled and i was like whoa no one's ever said that <laughs> no no business says that so <laughs> um that's pretty interesting and so you know you're like this is you know in, internally that's that's what we want to hear and uh I, I think that that's something we want to keep pushing for so you know what printing service can we do where we can say hey by the way when you're done with this just give it back to us just cut it up you know that's really cool yeah so again locally it makes really a interesting model it's easy local uh far away is hard mm-hmm you know, or, you know, so, so yeah. the system will be difficult and it's going to be something that takes a little bit of time to tease out. So I had two more comments on uh, the actual printing with RPEG. Um, yeah, actually, sure. I actually think Matt's better qualified to talk about it, but I just wanted to mention it. So with lar- large format printing, the RPEG is pretty cool because it works well as a high flow material. I'll let Matt talk about that. And then the other aspect is, um, so our uh, fulfillment manager, Ryan, he has a home built 3d printer and uh, he's got it set up really well with some good fans and good cooling. And he's actually done some really high detail prints with RPG. So it takes more tuning and a little bit more know-how, but you can actually do like high detail cosmetic printing with RPG successfully. And then at the same time, you can do large format 3d prints as well. And Matt's done a lot of large format 3d prints. Yeah, actually, I'll, I, I've been, I haven't, I don't know if I, if you guys saw this when I brought it in, but I actually am sitting on a 3D printed chair. Um, so <laughs> um, I, we do a lot of printing with like, we have a, a bunch of E3D supers um, and we, we drill the nozzles out to two millimeter. Um, and so we do a lot of two millimeter by uh, one millimeter layer height. And mm-hmm. we, we have a two and a half, but it gets a little wonky at two and a half. <laughs> um, you're just going from like 2.8 to two and a half. And it's, we, we've had a little bit of issues where like the center of the strand is still kind of not fully melted. It's mm. pretty weird. Um, mm-hmm. so, uh, um, huh. yeah, we're, we're, we're trialing some of the, the newer slice, uh, slice hot ends because we're pretty happy with the slice hot ends. So I'll say I'm excited to see where that one goes. Uh, but for now, we, we're using mostly the E3D supers, and I'll, sh- I'll get up and show you guys here this this chair. So it's actually this is the chair. Oh, so that's amazing! Wow. Yes, right <laughs> so, and then I'll pull this webcam down. You can actually see here the layers. I don't really I don't know if you guys can see that or if there's not enough light. But just yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah, just the kind of thickness of the bead. Yeah. So, and that, I'll say that ring right there, that was just, we were using scrap ABS and there's a little bit of black that got in there. So <laughs> that ring, but this is all done. This is all done in one piece. There's, a, you can see another ring on the bottom. It's all one piece. That's there. awesome. So, and then I have this, this is an RPG. There's a black one in the corner there. Okay. It's funny. So I, what? The, the ABS is actually so much lighter than the RPG. It's just the property of the plastic, but until I picked them up, I never really noticed. So, what kind of print speeds can you get out of RPG when you're doing a big nozzle like that? We still, I think we still print pretty slow. I think we're, I want to say we're still like 30 millimeter a second. We're not okay. super fast. That makes sense because, you know, you have to heat it up. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So, we probably could oh, yeah. run faster and run like a, a lower flow lower mm-hmm. you know but you know i'll say it's funny the two the big nozzles are actually like kind of less prone to issues i mean you definitely don't want to be doing a ton of islands like a ton of z hopping around and and jumping around but if you can do like one nice big continuous you know we we um we'll do like the not not the rectangular infill we'll do more infills that have just kind of like uh, they're not drooping on each other like full infills. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, full yeah, like grid or, or zeroed. Yeah. So just anything where you're not going to get a lot of drooping because that can cause some, some issues. Um, but it prints really well, actually. It's not a lot of problems, which is pretty cool. How have you combated Z-Seam? 
Uh, oh. In the past, when I've done big, thick layers, you know, when you when you get the lift at your seam, you always end up with like a gap before the the filament extrudes far enough to contact. And it, yeah, <laughs> you know, we have it dialed pretty well, but there's still a pretty big Z seam. It's still there, you know. Yeah. So I I I'm I'd have to talk to Sean to see what he's doing, but um, you know, it's it it's gotten better, but I think the earlier prints we had like gaps, like big, big gaps, big um, gaps figured out, but it, it, you know, I think on the furniture and things, it, it's not, it just doesn't seem to be too big of an issue. It's just, yeah. it's kind of always a spot where it's just kind of there or he might randomize it and maybe it doesn't look too bad randomized. A, little bit yeah, it, uh, a few years ago, I built an eight foot tall printer and made a, it was a precursor to a super volcano. Mm. Um, it was one of the things that convinced E3D that they really should build a super volcano. Was it two uh, volcanoes stacked? No, I I actually machined the um, the the heater block. It had uh, two forty watt heater cartridges in it uh, from the side, and then machined a nozzle to go in it. But it was a two millimeter nozzle, and um, we printed a seven and a half foot tall rocket with was, uh, was that at murph it wasn't murph mm-hmm. yeah I, I saw that machine yeah it was yeah, a giant piece of crap but i built it in two weeks <laughs> so <laughs> and it worked. Right? <clears throat> um, yeah that's what murph is for though it is that was exactly what it was for you know it, it printed that rocket and that was the only thing it ever printed um <laughs> I printed a few things with the hot end on other printers, but like that rocket had like five kilograms of filament in it. It was too expensive to like just constantly make stuff with. Yeah. (laughs) But we ran into that same thing where the core wasn't melted with the first try of the rocket. Um, And we ended up having to run PLA through that thing at like 290 at 30 millimeters a second to get it to fully melt. Yep. Yep. Sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. That's, I think that's the interesting thing that, that took us a while to learn. It was like, um, you know, you don't really know what the temperature at the nozzle is. You just know what the temperature of the block is. And yeah. so, you know, your, your basic heat transfer equations kind of tell you that if you want to transfer more heat, you got to raise the Delta T. So you gotta, you gotta raise the temperature. So, you know, it's funny you're at 290 C on PLA, but it's not actually at 290C. It's like the nozzle's really at whatever you want, be at 210 or something like that. Just don't let it sit very long. <laughs> don't, let yeah. it, don't let it stop and wait. Yeah. It's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we did so, that before the um, supers with the two, not, the two volcanoes. We stacked them on top of each other. And E3D told us about that. And we tried it. And it, I mean, we were, we were doing jobs better because of that. I mean, we were dropping time off of print jobs and we were doing it. It's a big deal. Uh, I sent Sanjay pictures of this, this hot end as I was making it. And he was like, dude, you could have just stacked two volcanoes. It would have been fine. And I was like, (laughs) that's a thing. (laughs) I put all this effort in. I could have just did that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Yeah. He told us about that. We were like, huh? that's a good idea. And we did it and we made a couple and we just kept doing it. And the supers yeah. came out and we bought a bunch and we bought 10 or something. So, yeah. yeah. So how far can you go with that? How many volcanoes can you stack? It's like infinite. You just keep yeah. putting heat breaks in it as couplers. Yeah. And well, eventually that little, that little E3D heat break is like uh, <laughs> hanging on for your life. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, 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 Broken so many heat breaks that we just started machining our own without the cutout. So we just were taking M6 stock and machining them because that was the only way we could keep them from, from bending. I mean, it was like, yeah, especially with the high flow stuff, if you get one thing wrong and that nozzle starts bumping on something, it's bent. It's done. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned that you guys are getting ready to make your own printer. Um, I really want to see that personally, um, I, yeah, you can show it off on the podcast if you want. I want to see it though. Yeah. Um, and then at Verf or Murph, one, one of the, one of the events that was virtual, you guys were showing off these like massive printers. Um, 
can you show us those? Yeah, are, absolutely. Are those are those where you are? Yeah, that's where I am. Hundred percent. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you guys some background really quick. Um, so we've had a printing service for four years or so, um, maybe. Uh, yeah, about four years, I think. Um, and we decided we wanted to start printing larger format. It was kind of a personal thing because that's kind of fun, um, but mm-hmm. also you know this would be a good uh, thing to be good at. Um, is, is something that we wanted to do. And so um, as a small business being pretty scrappy, um, you know, there weren't that many people building large format machines. The cost was fairly high. And we started making our own because, you know, you're a bunch of engineers who are 3D printing and you built printers in the past and you're just kind of a little bit naive. Um, and you're like, oh, yeah, I'll we'll just do it. And, um, and uh, so, <laughs> we, we made it, we've had a couple generations. I'd say we were very proud of our second generation, which is probably what you saw was big. Um, after you, you know, after using it a lot, we thought, well, you know, here's where we, here's the, here are the things we need to change. And the third gen is the machine that we're going to be selling. So we call that the Virago machine. It's the Virago 700, okay. 600 millimeter by 700 millimeter by 785. Uh, so that's about two, two feet by two and a half feet by a little over two and a half feet. It's almost three feet. And see, so that's a medium sized machine. We call it a medium sized machine. The bigger machines, the Gen 2 machines, they're four foot by four foot by three and a half. Um, so we have four of those machines, uh, as well as our Gen 1 machine, which is about three and a half cubed. Um, so they're, they're decently big. Um, they're all lead screw driven. Uh, they've got aluminum extrusion frames. Um, you'll see with the new machine, it's, it's all steel frame and it's all uh, ball screw driven. And it's all THK brand ball screw and uh, carriage rail. So it's all, it's all, it's the, the, I mean, it's the nicest machine we've ever built. We put all the monies into it uh, as far mm-hmm. as like, we didn't, you know, nice. spare too much. Um, so I think you'll see it, but yeah, the, the steel frame itself weighs about 750 pounds, maybe 800 pounds. It's all welded steel, uh, quarter wall tubes, uh, half inch plate on top. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's nice. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I <laughs> yeah. wanted to tell you guys that I want to tell you guys that now, just so when we go out and see it, you, I don't have to, you know, spend too much time out there explaining it. Um, so I'll go show you guys that if you don't mind, we'll go take a, a, a quick walk. Matt, you should tell them about the IC3D code name for the printer. <laughs> oh. Each printer gets its uh, own name. Let's see. Yeah. Big Rhonda. Big Rhonda. There's our here's our, here's our space <laughs> space themed room here. Got a little little That's fun. BMX bike frame action. Little stormtrooper head, little wheel. So yeah, little so, prints, little prints. Yeah, there's a Nothing there's big. a crate there's a crate here for a trade show. So another there's another uh, chair there. Little oh, there's a uh, it's the power armor. Ah, That's oh, nice. Power armor. Yeah. Oh wow. Power armor. Okay, so hi, Bay back here. You guys will see Taz, little farm of Taz is here. It's Sunday night, so a lot of stuff maybe stopped running. Got so these are our big printers here. So those are fun. Yeah. So are those all stepper driven? These are, yeah. These are all steppers. Okay. So you see. Lead screws. Got a little bit of insulation in them. Do you have heated enclosures on those or are they just heated by their bed? They are just passively heated, yeah. Okay. You buy the passively bed. Heated. I mean, it's a four kilowatt bed. So. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> like, I mean, the bed is kind of an enclosure here at that point when it's four foot by four foot, but like. It gets warm in there. So. <laughs> I, I bet. This is, try to see the thing. Uh, it's actually pretty tall. I mean, I, you can't really see me next to it. It's about a little taller than me. It's about six and a half feet tall. Um, that is much bigger than I thought it was. But yeah, I mean, if we go through here, you'll see like the welded steel frame here. There. I wish we could, I almost want you to be like Matt, pull off a side panel. Like there's just a lot of thought that's gone into this printer. Um, I do want to pull off a side panel. They're just very heavy. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, it's almost impossible to do with you holding your webcam and laptop, but so it really is yeah, cool. You'll see, you'll see these uh, ball screws here, ball screws up top. You'll see it's IDEX. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was IDEX. Yeah, it's IDEX. So you run dual ball screws on the gantry then? Yep. Yep. Nice. Ball screws. So hmm. it's going to be, um, oh, I can't, can't see it because it's so far back there, but there's encoders on those motors, so they're actually closed with motors. Nice. You should probably tell them about what our hot end is too. And then we've got yeah. separate filament storage on the printer underneath. Filament routing yeah. goes up through the back of the machine. Ooh. Yeah, the um, the hot ends right now. I want to show more of a close up. Um, we're running uh, slice magnum pluses. Uh, we're going to be trying or slice. Sorry, slice the magnums, and we're going to be trying. I think it's the plus. The the step up from that. That's got the dual heaters. Um, okay. And that'll be kind of the next thing that we trial. Um, those guys have shown us said that they said that there's uh, pretty good results. I'm a little disoriented here. Um, so we're definitely excited to test them, but we've had really good luck with the Magnum so far. Um, and we're running dies extruders, the dies extruders. Um, we've been pretty happy with them. Um, we haven't got to try the LGX, the Bontech LGX is yet. Uh, so that's going to be next. I'm pretty excited about the LGX. Everyone in the shop really wants to try the LGX. I'll yeah, show you those look here. great. Actually, which head's running here? I think the so, black head's running. Isn't it's it? the red head running here. So we'll see if it should should trigger here soon. Yeah, there yeah, you go. So this machine has the filament feeders running on it. <laughs> it is. So you've got dual That's 10 kg right. filament feeders right there underneath. It's like it's a belt it's belt driven from a 24 volt DC motor. It's got okay. a relay on an end stop. So whenever the filament hits the end stop, it duels it dulls out a little bit of filament. That's so cool. So you don't overspool. Uh, it can't yeah. spool on its own. So you won't get any freewheeling on your mega spool. Dope. That's awesome. I like that a lot. Is the okay. filament storage like heated or dried or anything? Um, it is not dried at the moment. Uh, so we're probably just going to keep some Ava dries down there for now. Um, it's definitely been a question we've been asked. So it's, it's in the books as far as something that we might be working on improvements in the future. Okay. Right now, just the bed heat alone is enough to keep the filament pretty dry. That chamber is going to stay fairly low humidity. But yes, in the future, we would have the option to do something like a, you know, a dried filament storage area. And it looks like a duet control. Yep. Yep. Is that a duet two or a three or nice? Yep, it's a three. So, so all the panels on the entire machine can come off. So it's pretty easy to get to your print. It's pretty easy to work on that entire side panel there with the ice duty logo that is removable in about two or three seconds. So yeah, you really can break this down uh, to the bare bones frame quickly. If you need to, to work on a print to clean off the bed. So you said that those motors are encoded. What? motors are you using because you you can't run an external driver off of duet three can you um so we are just working with duet they're working on uh, a board so they're working on the ability so i will say this i didn't say they're the they're not currently functioning so we're kind of waiting okay. we're kind of waiting for that functionality to come but we've been We've been discussing with Duet, and the functionality is on its way. So it has not happened yet. And awesome. Mine is unfortunately that sounds awesome. Not, uh, we're not really sure kind of when it's going to happen. But we've been very happy with the machine okay. running without the closed loop. So if it becomes yeah, an I, issue, then I, we I, might we've all been running. <laughs> <laughs> That's rad. It, and Duet, the Duet guys are great about those feature ads and like <laughs> when you come to them with a really good engineering idea, they're like, yeah. And then they get just as excited about it as you are. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Our electronics guru has been working with 
them pretty closely. Matt Moore has been working with them very closely, so it's been good. Nice. I probably should have gone back to show you guys the extruder, so I didn't think about it. <laughs> yeah, you should show them the giant grinder. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'll show you guys the grinder. All right. Hey, we got, we got the time. grinder, the extruders. <laughs> All right, let's go back. All of our resin dryers. There's a lot that goes into making filament. Um, but I also wanted to mention that uh, if you Google IC3D filament GitHub, you'll actually be able to see our open source uh, GitHub repository, and you'll be able to get an idea of how to make filament from that. Um, not much has changed in making filament, you know, since the invention of uh, – injection molding machines and uh, <laughs> extruder machines, um, single screw extruders. And uh, yep, you can see our line two right there. You look, Matt's walking by the water bath systems right there. Down on the ground in front of him is a giant water heater. Um, there's oh. the head of the machine, the die. And then show him the nozzle. That's the water heater. Show him the nozzle and the die. So this is actually the, the nozzle on the – we've got a five-millimeter nozzle to make three-millimeter filament. So you're drawing down the, the – hot plastic as it comes out, drawing it down through a water bath. You've got a set of conveyor belts. They're pulling it at a constant speed. Uh, the machine is running at a constant speed. And the difference of those two machines um, maintains the diameter of the filament. Uh, we recently added another piece of technology called a blender. It's that black and red thing sitting there on the top of the machine. So that's actually got four independent hoppers. And you can run different materials and different color additives in each hopper so that you can blend things. So this is called a blender. It uses a gravimetric way scale to actually measure out um, small amounts of material, mixes them up homogeneously, and then drops it into the extruder throat. And so that's how we're making the Recycle PEG. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, so this is all new technology we've recently that. added since we started making Recycle PEG. Oh, that's yeah. crazy. And then over where Matt's at now is all of our dryers. So that's a Novatech dryer there. That holds about uh, 250 pounds of resin. We've got PEG loaded up in there right now, I think. The other two dryers across the way, we've got our uh, experimental high temperature PEG. And then we've got, uh, I believe, ABS natural in the little blue dryer there. So all the materials have to be dried for at least eight plus hours before we can run any of them. Uh, and everything needs to be kept uh, basically out of the atmospheric air. That's all of our filament storage over there. We've got about, what is that? Uh, like three or four tons of material. Yeah. 1,600 pounds times six. <laughs> yeah. Little, uh, wow. So we've little, got a lot of material. on the low storage. side. Yeah, we are actually on the low side. We're, we are understocked right now. And then this is our grinder. Pretty big. I don't have any on the scale. Maybe you can... You'd see the grinder compared to the forklifts. Um, yeah. But basically, a... we can load full size, large format prints into the front of that grinder, and it comes out as pelletized plastic. And then that goes back into the machine, it comes out the side of that big um, funnel looking thing that's tucked away right now. Okay. But, is, um, is there regrind if I open these? Is yes, there there's regrind in there. There should be black regrind in that one right there, Matt. That should be black oh. uh, pet G regrind. That I remember is how to open from these. A customer that we uh, just yank on that. Hold on, <laughs> put this down for a minute. So the customer that's asked us to make, you know, recycle their prints, their prototypes. <laughs> that bin is oh. full of their prints. I'm pulling it, <laughs> okay, pulling the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you know what you're doing. Yeah, so. Maybe pull a handful out of there, Matt, so you can kind of see what it looks like. There we go. So, so it's yeah, kind it's, of powdery. It's a little different than what our normal raw material looks like, but that actually looks like it's mostly support material right there. You see the layers. Oh, wow. See the layers of the, th yeah. the little 3D print and the little small pieces. So, so that looks like it's mostly support material. Does the like powderiness and like not necessarily uh granular consistency matter when you're yes. running it through absolutely and that limits the maximum amount of regrind that you can actually run into the extruder and so the weight scale blender is great because 
the way that the um, solenoids, it's got air actuated solenoids. And so those air actuated solenoids, uh, one of them is designed specifically for adding regrind. So it helps okay. deal with the powders a bit more. Uh, but if you have too many powders in your extruder, they stick to the throat which is the area of the machine where there's uh, unmelted plastic. It's called the solid bed area. And if powders build up in the solid bed area and become softened, then you'll jam the extruder <laughs> and you will lose the strand and you have to pull the whole machine apart. It's kind of a nightmare. Ah, uh, yeah. How often yeah, does that It's like happen? eight hours later type of job. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> see this product here on the shelf here. That's all PETG. There's some mega spools of our colors. Yep. Okay. PETG, <laughs> and then we've got PLA. We've got one bay of PETG there. We're a little low on stock on the 175, it looks like. And then we've got all of our PLA product. We've got two bays of PLA and two bays of ABS. Um, so we are fully stocked. And we've got an entire greenhouse behind Matt that's also full of filament. We've got two greenhouses. We've got one that stores print shops filament, and then we've got another one that stores uh, customer filament. So, okay. Are, are those greenhouses for like climate control and dryness yep. and everything? Exactly. We've got humid, uh, dehumidifiers running in there. And then we've got sensors that are telling us the indoor and outdoor. Well, sorry, the uh, shop humidity and then the greenhouse humidity. And we're trying to regulate that to under 20% at all times. Nice. Anything else for our walk back? Anything else? Um, show them the respoolers. Maybe the fulfillment oh, area. Three spools, three spools. So the, the large mega spools obviously get broken down into smaller spools. And so uh, we have our own in-house machines that we use to do that. So the mega spool sits on that giant aluminum bar there to our left. And then the smaller spool gets loaded here and onto this blue motor. And then there is a traverse mechanism that travels back and forth and is matched to the rate of rotation of the smaller spool. Uh, and then we actually count, we do it by rev counts. So we count the number of rotations to find out, uh, when the spool is full and then the machine just shuts down automatically for the operator. Uh, we've recently added a bunch of upgrades. So like, as we just talked about the mega spools, they're always over spooling and freewheeling. So we just added a, a disc brake off of a bike system. So we've got disc brakes on there now. They're actuated by solenoids. So when the spool finishes, it will actually, uh, close that disc brake and stop the spool so it doesn't make a tangle for the operator so they can start the next spool a lot faster. So a lot of um, <laughs> fun <laughs> DIY projects around IC3D. Uh, we recently upgraded from using, you know, Arduino Nanos and Arduino Megas to PLCs. There's a Siemens, a cheap uh, P a Siemens PLC, like an entry-level PLC that we're now using to control um, those respoolers. And so the ah, right. owner, Michael Cow, actually just got done upgrading us to those Siemens systems. And those are actually able to be accessed from our network so we can upload new source code um, nice. remotely. And, you guys um, didn't even like this. cheap out on your PLCs and do an automation direct one. <laughs> I think that actually is an automation direct, but it's or automation 24 maybe. Uh, the automation yeah. direct has their own brand and they're like, they're cheap, cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's no, awesome. we wanted to get siemens we wanted to get siemens stuff um you know we need reliability at this point we can't have those machines breaking down <laughs> so there's all of our spooled product on the left that's vacuum sealed waiting to be boxed up um, matt show them the vac sealers i guess we got two vac sealers this is our staging area where we box the product up there's our vac sealers um so this is i don't know if you guys have met Ryan, but Ryan's active are on our Twitter accounts and uh, he runs all the fulfillment. So this is Ryan's world. Okay. I think uh, I've met Ryan before. Yeah, you probably have it. Maybe at uh, Murph. Yeah. He was at the Murph table, the last live one. <laughs> we were there. He probably came Dog and got beer from us. Probably. <laughs> he definitely <laughs> has a good beer. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the shop, guys. I don't know if there's any nice. questions. I kind of a very brief overview, but yeah. Oh, this is oh, awesome. That's awesome. Matt, show them the frames for the Virago. I think that's interesting. Oh, sure. So that's what it looks like when it's got the body on it, but the frames are over here in the corner. 
so the empty frames look quite a bit smaller, but you can see how those panels pop off the sides so you can get to the bed mm. and everything. Yeah. Little, so all the electronics messy, are down underneath. You can see a little bit more. It's all milled aluminum blocks. Holding everything. Do you guys do all the welding and machining in-house? No, no. Those are all local vendors. Okay. We have a great local vendor out of Circleville, Ohio, that makes the frames, and they are extremely professional and timely. Um, I don't think I could ever. <laughs> I don't think yeah, we could those, compete with the quality that they turn out for the price. That frames, they the frames are pretty wild. They're they pretty look impressive. really well built. They, yeah, they are very well done. So you can see a little bit about the a little more of the beds here. So. There's some That's isolation, uh, heat isolation between the bed and the aluminum um, frame that's actually attached to the lead screws there. Okay. And it's magnetic build plate so that the uh, bed is removable. Yeah. That is a yeah. huge build custom. plate. <laughs> yeah, it's a <laughs> custom build plate. Yeah. I think we're going to ultimately be moving to embedded hard magnets. Uh, but I think this was like a really fast way to kind of get going. What are you guys liking for bed materials for the massive printers? Um, well, I'll say the Virago is running PEX right now from Wham Bam. Um, we are trialing um, the powder coated PEI. So we do use the powder coated PEI um, on our Tazis right now. Um, as far as the big machines, the beds are so big that we don't have removable plates. So we are using bed weld. Um, so okay. we're using, right now, we're using layer in here. Nice. So we've tried a few other things. The layer near seems to be the most universal. So. Okay. That I hate I hate using bed weld on a giant machine, but for now, uh, unless we switch to vacuum beds and we mill big beds, uh, that's it's the simplest what method to go, and it's been working fairly well, you know, surprisingly. Yeah. But you know, it's it's really difficult to say, yeah, start this huge awesome printer, and here's your little here's your little glue stick, you know. <laughs> it's not a glue <laughs> stick, but you know what I mean. Like, Basically, though. Yeah, yeah. It works well. No, what awesome. questions do you guys have? I mean, we just showed you a lot. I'm kind of curious oh. where, where your minds are at or like, <laughs> you know. Um, so on your on your respoolers, uh, are your traverses tied to um, like the amount of filament that's on the spool? Because like that diameter changes, right? Yes, so, the diameter of the spool grows as you as you turn more revolutions, right? Right. Absolutely. So then the um, traverse is mechanically connected to the, to the motor that's turning the smaller spool. And it turns okay. at a predetermined rate that you can adjust on the fly. Uh, we normally would not adjust it. It's um, The traverse rate is actually more tied to the diameter of the filament that you're running, right? So if you're running like a 175 oh, yeah, yeah. filament, it doesn't fill up the row as quickly as the three millimeter filament would. So you have to turn up the traverse rate for a three millimeter spool. Is that a calculated rate or is it like, that looks pretty good. Like potentially it's eyeballed. Kind of thing. It's eyeballed for right now. It's, it's manually done by the operators uh, and it's manually tuned over the court. Let's say you're doing a mega spool, right? And you've got to do 10, one kg units off of that. It's kind of a set it and forget it, but uh, you're going to want to manually adjust it here and there. Um, more so the end stops on the traverse than the actual traverse speed. Now we're working on a generation two uh, respooler where that is actually done with a stepper motor. So we're basically taking 3D printer technology and sticking it on a respoolers, right? So we're going to have end stops, stepper motor with the lead screw, the traverse is controlled by, um, you know, a PLC that's mm -hmm. uh, connected to, um, a load cell that load cells measuring the tension on the strand and maintaining a specific amount of tension on the strand, those sort of things you need to do to uh, achieve like a perfect wrap every time. Right. So yeah. we're not able to go out and purchase a commercial 
respooling machine that's robotically controlled. You know, we can't afford a hundred thousand dollar respooling machine, but we can build something that does the same thing for a few thousand dollars. Um, and the, the cool part is we have enough in-house experience between the various guys here. We all tag team a project like that. We can make it happen. So, yeah, I, I built effectively the exact same machine for, uh, the textiles industry in a previous job, like oh, neat. stepper driven traverse. Um, the, uh, traverse speed was kind of governed by where we were in the wrap. Um, mm -hmm. It was, <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we will we'll be able to do those sorts of things on our upgraded machine. Right now, we're yeah. kinda, you know, it's a bare bones operation in that sense. Um, Interesting. That's really cool. Uh, it's, it, yeah, that's neat. <laughs> I have a question. So I think this whole recycled P PTG and the Recycle Spool program is a really kind of innovative program to try and... Um, pioneer. Um, I haven't seen that much other innovation in the filament space besides like, um, was that the expanding PLA or whatever? Um, w where do you see the, the filament space going in the future? Cause it seems like we're kind of running out of innovations in the filament space and all we're seeing is just kind of new colors and different blends. Um, like where, where do you see, where do you see this filament space going? And do you see like any new you know, filament makers coming out? Like, like, is it that saturated now? Like, is it, is there no point in making new filaments or like, where do you see that going? Great question. Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> so, um, I'll say with what we do being vertically integrated, having a little bit of every single piece of the, you know, the puzzle, um, we like to say that we like to solve solve problems or you know develop new applications and so that the the virago printer specifically i'll use as an example um when we sell that to a customer we intend to be developing we we expect most customers to be printing one or two things only now obviously there's going to be a lot of people who just want to prototype and print lots of different things but in general you find big companies they print they find man, I've got this piece for my telescope. I do 30, 40 big telescopes a year, and I just need to make that one big piece. It's really hard to make any other way. Um, cool. That guy, he's probably only been printing that one piece, maybe two pieces. Um, and so we expect that that guy is going to be coming to us. We're going to say, we're going to dial the material in, we're going to dial the machine in, and we're going to give them the machine, say, hey, it, it prints the thing you wanted. Um, so I think that you're going to see in the material world the same thing you see in, I don't want to say injection molding, but in, in resins and in, in thermoplastics in general, you're going to see things built for very specific applications. And I've even had filament, um, I've had bigger companies kind of pitch materials to us and say, hey, we got this new material. Here's what it is. You want to try it? And I'm like, cool. What do you do with it? And they're like, you know, automotive or so, you know, they give me like a generic, I'm like, no, like, you know, like, this is a very specific thing you have. Like, what's your application? It sounds like there's a reason you made this, you know, and sometimes the reason could be, uh, we are really good at, uh, we are X resin company. We're, we're super specialized at this type of resin. We wanted to get into 3d printing. That could be a reason, but they might not say it. Um, but, um, uh, the reality is that, you know, I think, uh, like our, our ABS is made by a company called Chime. Chime makes like, 40 ABSs, like, I don't know, 50 ABSs or something, you know? So you think, well, in filament world, you know, ABS is kind of ABS. D there's a couple, there's different ABSs out there for sure, but no one's sitting there going, well, I like uh, ABS M30 because I'm going to be, you know, exposed to this much UV and, it, you know, <laughs> you know no one's, no one's doing that kind of thing. So I just think as you, you get deeper and deeper, you're going to start seeing, um, uh, like a, like, you know, I don't want to say UV pet G is a really basic example, but, um, man, I like pet G, but I need to use it outside. All right. Here's pet G with the UV additive. Cool. Uh, you know, IC3D could release five pet G's. We could release a UV pet G, our regular pet G, a recycled pet G. Uh, we could put an impact modifier in our pet G cause pet G is kind of brittle. Like, you know, I, I think you're going to start, I mean, at least personally, that's what I need as an engineer. I, you know, we're solving problems. Um, 
And we just ran into that problem the other day. We had a, a guy who's printing all his parts out of PLA and we go, all right, we'll, we'll print these out of PETG. It'll be a little bit better. He's like, ah, cool. That makes sense. And the PETG was too brittle and it was breaking. When we put it in and typically we'd make mm-hmm. a design change, but the, the PLA works or so we're going to PLA, but we're like scratching our heads. We're like, I've never seen that before, you know? So now I want to be able to go to my catalog and be like, uh, I need a PETG, but I need to be less brittle. Well, I don't have that, you know? So, um, you know, so that's that's kind of the, the, the tricks. I think that's where we're going to be headed. And at least for IC3D in general, you know, we're we're behind on releasing filaments, but we're we're, uh, I think, ahead on kind of trialing different things. Um, and, and there are a lot of resin manufacturers that you're seeing. The big resin manufacturers are coming out going, all right, well, we, we have like a thousand polycarbonates. Like here's four polycarbonates. So you're like, all right, well, that's a good start. That's cool. Um but the, I think the difficult thing there is also those guys are going to get discouraged really quickly because this is kind of a long road of, of teaching people how to use those four different polycarbonates and they're not going to make as much money as they're used to making for a long time. Um, and you see, you, you see it, you see that battle uh, happening. You see Owens Corning was in and they pulled out and I think DuPont was in and their stuff was awesome. Pff, DuPont's gone. Uh, they're out. I, you know, maybe they'll get back in later. Right. On. But, um, you know, so this is a really long winded way of saying, you know, we're just going to start growing into application specific materials. So, yeah. Nice. That's what I think. I want that impact resistant PETG. Yeah. I, I get it. Yeah. I've been there's a lot of different it. props that I'm thinking of. <laughs> I'm glad that I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad you said that we have a 70 D TPU. Yeah, okay. And sure. it basically, it feels like hard parts, but you could, you know, you could hit it with a hammer. Uh, it's super high impact. Um, but it is kind of expensive still it's TPU. Um, and it still kind of comes with TPU quirks, although you can run it really quick like pet G. Um, but I would prefer a pet G with a little bit, less brittleness and it's something i've been desiring myself um, so i think it's going to be something that we work on um, and luke's working on an sbir with with army um, for making tooling and that's a very specific material we want a material uh we're going to be use it using it for tooling for potting wires so they're going to be they the, you know the custom cables they're going to pot these cables uh with you know two-part mixture uh the the tools sit at what did I sit at like 190 F for like 30 minutes or something. 180. 180F for 30 minutes or something. And they want to be able to print them. Yeah, and they want to be able to print them on a basic printer. So, you know, there you have a really specific application. Yeah, I want they want to, to use like a commercial off the shelf like a Taz. Yeah. Hey, the so, army always has such reasonable requests, don't they? <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it's really not no, crazy. They've, they've opened up a lot more recently. Yeah. It's really not crazy. So I mean, actually I think open that... to some other some other printers. You know, I'm hearing about. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking Maker Gear. Maker Gear came out with their high temp printer, right? What's that called? The something one. Um, no, anyway, their high, high temp. Ultra the Ultra One, yeah. So we recently heard that you know they're open to possibly purchasing a, a machine like that to run this tooling material. So that's that's new. Um, and that's pretty cool. You're seeing, I, I think we're seeing some changes within, uh, you know, within the government, within the army. They're definitely a lot more open to to trying new things than I think people give them credit for. Let's just put it that way. That hasn't been my experience on the project I am currently working on with them. But <laughs> I'm glad that yeah. you have a team that's working <laughs> with you. <laughs> Additive manufacturing group might be a bit different, you know, a little bit more. Uh, I, this is this is concrete additive manufacturing. It's a it's the same, but different. <laughs> yeah, whole stupid world. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. I have lots of questions, but maybe <laughs> I want to kind of answer Aaron's question a little bit, and from my own perspective, I think Matt did a great job answering it. I'm just going to give a very blunt answer. I think a more of a like high level, straightforward answer. Um, I think that, yes, you're going to see application-specific materials coming out. Is the market saturated? Not yet. Is it quickly becoming saturated? Yes. Who's competing in those spaces? I mean, yeah, bigger filament companies are churning out new materials all the time, right? Like, if you want to go find an application-specific material, 
you can. They're out there. You probably never even heard of them, right? There's a lot of materials out there. There's hundreds. I would say there's probably thousands of materials available now. There's at least multiple hundreds of materials available. Um, and, you know, they're varying in cost, right? Like, are they are they achievable for a hobby type person? Are they achievable for somebody like myself printing at my house? Probably not. Um, but then I think the other part of your question is, is the filament world going to change dramatically? Like, is there going to be anything that changes leaps and bounds wise? I don't really think so. Like, I don't see the raw material changing that much. I mean, it's like 3D printing, right? Like people have been using ball screws and stepper motors for, for 30, 40, 50, 70 years. Like, you know, it's been, you know, this stuff's not new, right? Like we're still CNC machines and three axis machines haven't changed in eons and they're not going to change. Like that technology doesn't change. So filament, I guess, you know, that's not going to change as far as we're going to have to feed plastic into the machine somehow. Now is pellet printing going to change things? Yes, absolutely. Are you going to see a lot more people doing their own recycled materials? Are you going to see a lot more people playing around with mixing resins at the hobbyist level? Absolutely. I mean, when you, when people get those, you know, when people get a hold of something like that, what's the first thing you're going to do with it? You're going to play with it, right? You're going to mess around, try some stuff out. And probably people in the industry that, you know, larger companies that are in the industry are going to learn from hobbyist type folks doing funny stuff, doing things that they didn't think of, experimental stuff. That's going to happen. Um, but I think you'll see, I think you'll see that, um, you know, anybody can make filament. But my, my biggest fear, I guess, or not necessarily a fear, but, you know, how do things normally go in any industry? It's diversified at first, and then somebody comes out as a front runner and starts to monopolize. And then you start to see one brand take over, right? I don't, that is something I don't want to see happen in a 3D printing industry. And I think we're far off from that, um, which is great. And that's somewhat due to um, the love of open source that like 3D printer, 3D printer enthusiasts have, uh, which is great. So I think that keeps things fresh. Um, But I do think that eventually, 3D printing will become a mainstream enough thing that large players with, you know, a lot of funds are going to get involved. And then you'll start to see uh, things group up, you know, you'll start to see things group up a bit more. How far out are we from that? I have no idea. <laughs> it could be 20 years. You know, I don't it's know. Already more, it's already more consolidated than it was back in the crazy, the Kickstarter craze of everybody was starting a desktop 3D printing company whatever that was five years ago. <laughs> oh man, that was, yeah, that was crazy. So like, that's an interesting point though. Like, I, I keep waiting for, like we've seen like the, the hype drop, like the hype shadow, right. Where, you know, it's, it's become less about like everybody coming out with their own company and now things are starting to stabilize, but I don't see this hobby dropping off anytime soon. It like Murph was a really good indicator of that. Like, the last year of in-person Murph was just insane. And I think we were all kind of going into that Murph like, yeah, this, this year is kind of going to die. And then Friday was the biggest day we'd ever seen. And like everybody's usually half drunk setting their machines up on Friday. So it was a, it was really crazy. And then, uh, you know, COVID happened and everybody was back like, Oh wait, 3d printing is a thing. And they're important. Uh, so I'm really, I'm curious what the next few years have to offer for us, especially with like patents expiring this year with SLS and the heated enclosure dying. Um, I, I think we're, I think we're in for a really interesting time. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating. I think it was like the last like CES of 2020, there was like no, no printers like revealed there. And so people are saying, you know, 3D printing is officially dead. Yeah. It's like, you know, there's no no new techie startups releasing a printer now. So now now it's a either a race to the bottom or a race in quality, you know, as far as, you know, demographics. Yeah. What do you guys think about SLA printing? 
or SLS or I don't know. What do you have? You guys got into that at all? What's your thoughts on FFF versus SLA? I think that's an. I mean, it all depends on the. It depends on the thing that you're trying to make. Like it depends on. Especially when it comes to a lot of the stuff that I make, a lot of that has to do with high detail. So there, there may be bigger parts of a complete project that I don't need as high a detail or I can buff them out real quick, but there might be smaller parts where I need really high detail and I need it to look really good without a lot of cleanup. Um, and so I, I'll absolutely use SLA for that. Um, I've, I've talked about it plenty. I got a, I got an LA glue Mars as a joke. Um, thinking that it was just not going to be shit because like it was 300 bucks on Amazon. I was like, this is going to be a piece of crap printer. It's not going to work like blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's one of my most dependable printers. Like that is literally one of the printers that I, I can like hit go on and it's almost always going to work. There's only been a few times where it hasn't. And that was because I neglected cleaning it rather than it actually not working. Um, and yeah, it's it's great. Um, whereas like FDM or FFF, like I've honestly, that's the one where I have the most issues. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. granted, granted, most, all of my printers are custom in some way or another. And so I have made that harder for myself. Um, but custom not in a good way. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's those very specific things where I'm like, yeah, you can go ahead and do that to my printer. It'll work. Um, and dude, then I just get stuck with a printer that I'm like, man, this is, this is going to work at some point. I just have to learn how to use this now. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's, it really depends on the application that you're, you're going to be able to do it. I haven't been able to mess with SLS at all. Um, but SLA, like if I'm doing any miniature work, if I'm doing any high detail cosplay parts or artwork or anything like that it blows me away every time how good it is. Um, and even with a real crappy program, like a uh, Cheetah box, like it, it works like you just throw it in there and it, it'll pop out a file that'll make it work. Um, and I don't even have like a, a real good one. Um, like mine is still one of the original LCD screens. It's not one of the newer 4k or 2k models. Um, so it's like, it's a decent screen, but it's not one of the better ones. Um, but it still works. It's it's still a good printer. Um, yeah, like it. I I can definitely see a good portion of the printing future leaning towards that because of high detail and uh, low amount of uh, post processing that you have to do on that. Like the cleanup and everything is is not going to get any better because it's just the nature of resin, but like the resins are getting what, easier to deal with. But. They are to say like, that was, that was one thing that Joe warned me about when, when I got mine was he was like, the smell's going to be terrible. Just, you're just going to have to get used to it. I've never dealt with a smell. Like I, when I initially pull off the box, I'll get like a whiff, but normally I'm wearing a mask. And so it's like just a little bit, but it's like, it's continually advanced to where it's like, nah not really like i just have it over a vent now and that way it's venting out any toxic stuff that could be in the air but uh yeah like it's sla is great to be honest like yeah i'm uh, the yeah. exact opposite <laughs> i i have a prusa sl1 which is an awesome printer but i joke that it's my only fans because the only thing i print on it is fan ducts for my fff printers uh because mm-hmm. i hate sla <laughs> Only fans. <laughs> what a you joke. need to label great that. Fandoms. That's pretty That's fucking great. <laughs> yeah, like you know, I could I could print all kinds of awesome fan duck geometry with it, and uh, they'll come out amazing and strong. And um, <laughs> that's the only thing I do with it. But I really, really can't wait for SLS to get affordable and get awesome. Um, you know, there's the one kit printer that you can do that's like ten thousand um, dollars. That's not a huge volume, but I'm really, really interested in that coming down to a point where it's in the couple thousand dollar level and you can get really accessible with it. So is there any software that supports that or is it, or just be like super custom? I really don't know. It, 
it's going to kind of be the same idea as an SLA, like a true SLA. Yeah. But I don't know. I haven't, I haven't dug into it at all. I'm just, I'm just curious. I bet we Matt, could talk light burn into doing it. <laughs> My take on SLA. Yeah. Just uh, talking about FF F and SLA SLS, like where's the, you know, where's the market going? And I think that's just an interesting topic because each has its own niche, I guess. Will it always, you know, will FFF always have a place? Will SLA always have a place? I don't know. Like it's just an interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, it's no absolutely <laughs> depends on what you're making. I would say that the thing I've been the most impressed by, and I haven't got to use one yet, but the, any of the powder, any of the powder stuff. So the SLS F, MJF, um, I mean, I yes. definitely looked into, I'm definitely starting to look into, should we be, should we be using an SLS? Should we be using an HP machine instead of, um, trying to print? Like we, we don't like to print small detail parts. You know, if I have to do a hundred tiny parts, um, you know, the guys spend tons of time tuning them in and then once they're tuned in, you know, that kind of price for what it is just doesn't make any sense for us. Mm, so yeah. for us, it's, you know, it's, it's always finding out what you do the best with the tools you have. So, you know, we do the best with big prints. We do the best with a lot of kind of average geometry, medium size or small prints. Um, but if I want to do, you know, if I've got a customer that wants 500 to a thousand, something that's kind of intricate needs to be functional, it, it's probably going to be done with powder, you know? So that's yeah. really my favorite from what I've seen from the prints that we paid for and things that we've gotten back. Um, you know, we're definitely looking at making a lot of Virago parts out of SLS uh, instead of aluminum or in, instead of FDM because uh, it just looks so good. Mm -hmm. uh, SLA, um, I, I mean, I think there it's always, I think those are always going to have their place for something. Um, but yeah, my experiences haven't been awesome. I haven't touched an SLA machine in forever. So that's like, you, you know, don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, in the industrial world, there the, the little bit that I've seen, there are a lot of material advancements, really cool, non-super fragile. It used to be super fragile. Everything was really fragile. Um, and I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, but I don't know as far, I think it's like FDM where it's like pumping out a lot of parts in some instances can be difficult. I don't know. I've seen the monoprice, little monoprice one, I think is a monoprice one. Um, that one of, one of our guys was playing with. Yeah, there used that to was, be. And he was like, I swear he was like pumping out parts pretty quick. Um, I just don't, I don't have that much experience with it. So again, you know, I spent a lot of our time trying to find areas that what we do fits in, but the SLS and the MJF is hard to ignore mm. for me. And Stratus is supposed to come out with ah, like for a sure. com competitor machine here soon. So we're going to see what that is. Have you guys looked into like the granular machines? So not not necessarily pellet feed, but like the gran granule feed, um, it's for like high flow and and all of that. How is that different from pellet printing? Maybe I'm not familiar. They are. Uh, Stratasys was doing this at one point where it was they were like a quarter of the size of pellet, mm -hmm. um, and it was it was on a machine that was kind of like the belt where it had like an infinity Z and uh, you know, it was all, mm. all hopper driven. Mm. It, it that reminds sense. me of another question that I had. I feel like that's going to be similar to the belt printer at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pretty pretty much much smaller. Yeah. Would make it lighter. So that can maybe lead to higher print speeds. Um, They're adding a very small amount of material at a time as well. Usually those are vacuum fed, right? Yeah. At one point, there was discussion of a larger filament diameter mm -hmm. standard for high output. Have you guys dug into that at all or messed with the hot ends that were? <laughs> we have made a filament that was a six millimeter spec. I think that was, okay. was that a test material for a 3D platform, Matt. Is that right? Yeah, it was. It was it was pretty difficult to make. Um, I think we would, use. we would be fine if we spent more time on it. Um, I think at the time that the promise of it didn't seem to be super high. 
uh, yeah. we spent some time on it. And then I want to say I mean, we just got distracted with something else and just kind of moved on from it. But yeah, that makes we, sense. We, we I, did I, attempt to make it and we did. Um, it has the potential to work. I think that when you work with filament diameters that large, it becomes cumbersome. And like if you mm-hmm. work with brittle materials or high performance materials in that large of a diameter, it's going to be almost impossible to figure out filament routing for a head on a large format 3D printer unless the spool is on the head itself. Like it's just, it's not going to, you're at that point, you're going to want to go pellet. I, th- I think. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have yeah. a couple of machines I saw it on. The, the, the spool was mounted way high directly over the filament platform. So yeah. that, like spool routing or wasn't even a thing. Right. It's just like way <laughs> above it. So it can't do, can't get messed up. Yep. Huh. At some point, you're just feeding a rod. But it yeah. looked like they were feeding Ethernet cable, is what it looked like, because <laughs> it was like light blue. <laughs> I, I would have to imagine. I don't remember what it was like, Luke, but I have to imagine it was really stiff. So stiff. And like, so, you know, if that stuff isn't cooled in a perfectly straight line, then when it comes off the spool, it just wants to be a big coil, like a big spring. And mm. then it gets caught on everything. It's just cumbersome. And then think about trying to use like a carbon material like that. It would be nearly impossible. Like, I don't think yeah. that uh, going I, at that point, I really think that you would want to switch to a granular or pellet fed machine. Uh, if you want to hit high volume and high print speed and not have to deal with the headache of, that huge of diameter of filament it's just too cumbersome i think interesting but yeah, I, wonder if I mean it could definitely work you know? i mean it i wonder if they sold any of those machines <laughs> yeah i don't know that's a good question yeah i mean they've got if, you know if you look up online they've got all their heads all their different heads up there but i don't mm-hmm. know which one's which um i will say they talked about it for a long time before we ever made any and at the time when we made some, they had only made PLA. So it wasn't like they really had made a lot of progress, this, okay. to my knowledge. I mean, this was maybe, what, Luke, a year and a half ago or something? Yeah, it might have been longer than that now. But I think yeah. right but around they, there, Matt, you're right. They have been talking about it for like a couple of years, I think, before we even were kind of in the picture at all with it. And I don't think they've gotten okay. too far from what I know. So. Yeah, because I saw it at the 2016 IMTS. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that so was a while ago. A while ago. So, it's interesting. I mean, at this point, you're going to see more pellet extruders be just off-the-shelf parts. Um, at least at least in the industrial world. You know, maybe hobby world, I, there won't be... I don't know if there's any little guys that are well-known that are yeah. cheap. But in the industrial world, you'll, you, you, it was like these two people made their own. If you want to make a pellet printer, just make your own extruder. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the only thing you can do. And um, now you can at least buy a few. There's a couple you can buy. Huh. Maybe five to 10K, but you can buy them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fair well, enough. there's the one that just came out that was like a grand. That was kind of enticing. But and it was, they showed it on like an Ender 3. And it was kind of like, why? <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah all right i mean res- well, do you guys have pellets really no, pellets really cheap pellets compared to filament really cheap so you know from a yeah. personal standpoint if i had to you know you know i've printed you know several hundreds and hundreds of pounds of stuff for myself but like you know i'd rather just buy pellets i think that the yeah. one piece of information that's missing from that discussion about running pellets though is filament drying you have to dry all those pellets. You're going to have to have a separate drying system that is then vac loaded and fed into your 3D printer. Uh, yeah. Those resins have to be extremely dry. You know, you were talking parts per million uh, pieces of, you know, parts per million water content in each of those pellets to get, to not have um, layer adhesion issues, to not have like zits on your prints and things like that. So one thing to, you know, one um, area that I think that 3D printing hobbyists haven't crossed yet is really like resin drying. 
that's not mm-hmm. something that, you know, hobbyist folks, they dry their filaments, but it's usually like baking it in an oven or throwing it in, um, you know, a toaster oven for a little while. But that kind of drying is not going to cut it for a pelletized printer. So I think that that's one area that you will see boom. If you if pellet printing takes over, drying filament is going to become a serious thing and there's going to be a new market for that type of stuff. Is it like Sorry, side note, like a vacuum <laughs> oven type thing or is it like a hot air exchange? Yeah, vacuum oven can work. Uh the industry standard for drying classic resins for the past 50 years has been desiccant dryers. Um, it's a closed loop system. So you're forcing air, you're forcing hot air into the resin. And then mm-hmm. that air that is evacuated from the resin goes back into desiccant. So the moist hot air goes back into desiccant. It's cooled down a bit and the desiccant sucks the moisture out. And then that same air is fed back into the resin in a continuous fashion. So that, and then um, that desiccant will actually become wet over a period of time. And so you'll have to renew the desiccant. And so there's different technologies for how to renew that desiccant. Um, But the simplest way is to switch to a new bed of desiccant and then dry out the wet stuff while the dry stuff is in process and drying the resin, drying the plastic pellets. So that's kind of how it's done in the industry. Um, But yes, there are other technologies out there. Vacuum, you can use vacuum a combination of vacuum and heat and desiccant. You can even use microwaves to get rid of it. Um, there's a lot of different technologies out there to get to dry filament and dry pellets. Nice. All right. Well, we are way deep into this podcast. This is probably one of our <laughs> longest episodes so far. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you guys have anything else? Um, Sorry yeah. about that. Good discussion. No, that's that fascinating. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, really we've covered, you know, most, most of what we're trying to get out there is the recycled materials. We're trying to really kind of explain our involvement with, you know, recycled materials and, and what we're trying to do and find ways to do more of it. So. Okay. Any, any awesome. feedback, you know, any feedback on our, our spore return system, you know, uh, really curious to see how it pans out if you guys want to come visit us come visit us i mean i would say even if you didn't have any spools to return on that day you guys want to come visit us let me let me know okay so heck yeah, yeah this is a work All in right. progress so we definitely work want progress. feedback and we love okay. giving tours so we hopefully with, yeah. with with times of change in a little bit hopefully we'll be able to give more we yeah. like it when people come to visit us we want to meet folks show them what we're doing talk you know share ideas of course well, that's great that that's a really good attitude to have awesome <laughs> okay well uh with that uh, i'm gonna go ahead and say uh everybody should keep making stuff <laughs> and i'm gonna say this is the end of the podcast all right Thanks, guys, guys for coming on. Thanks for having us. This was awesome. This has been awesome. Yeah, Yeah, I love doing these. So, yeah, if you guys if you guys have any questions, just I don't know anything in general that um, you know you're just kind of thinking about later. You know, just shoot me an email. Ask me anything. We'll do for sure. Awesome. Especially with say hi to Ryan on the Twitterverse. Yeah, say hi to say hi to Ryan. See what he's thinking. (laughs) He's got a lot of interesting right. input on all of this stuff as well. But yeah, yeah, I appreciate you guys having us on. This is awesome. So we, sure. love, we love doing tours. I really need to work on uh, walking around with the camera a little bit better. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's rad. Um, well, maybe in the near future, we, we always joke, have talked about doing a like maker tour where we go visit places like you guys and do an interview and do a walk around to the shop and like make a full YouTube video out of that. And right around the time we were going to start that COVID. Mm. Uh, so, you know, this year we're hoping to maybe do that and you guys aren't that far away. So maybe that could be on the roster. Yeah. Let us know. We'd like that. Awesome. Did you stop the recording? No, I did not stop the recording. We're going. Did you stop the recording? I can't.
<laughs> All right. <laughs> this is the end of the podcast for real, guys. We're going to try not to Midwest goodbye this any longer. We're professionals. <laughs> something like that <laughs> all right thanks everybody for being on i'm i'm gonna click stop now.